Hey, welcome to Bear Mountain today. Today we are doing something with our tomatoes. What are we doing? We've got a bunch of twine and a bunch of tomatoes that need to be tied up. Stay tuned and we'll show you how we're doing the Florida weave. Okay, the Florida weave, what does that mean? Well, it's a really big term for basically taking two pieces of twine and interweaving them like this. And in between the interweaves is your actual tomato plant. So if you have a strong set of stakes, depending on how close you put your plants and how big your plants ultimately will get, and you do this string weave, about every foot or so or whenever the plants start to get floppy they will keep the plants on an upright basis so for indeterminate plants this is actually a, a fairly cheap way of keeping them elevated and heading up um, when you don't have a, a greenhouse structure like people in greenhouses they typically will use leader strings that go from the base of the plant up to some support structure that is either the steel structure of the the hoop house itself or some kind of um, frame that might have been put in to support it. These guys can get pretty heavy uh, as they get bigger and bigger over the course of the summer. So an indeterminate plant will continue to grow until you take out that top growth stem. And part of the process of growing these guys is you need to give them support otherwise they'll grow just like a vine and they'll just lay down on the ground and go forever so we've had some bad weather our first part of june uh, has been very cool and wet and so uh, these guys at first kind of slowed down but now they're kind of picking up now that we're warming up and it's time to do some pruning and to put in the next layer of the the weave trellis um, you can see here, when you look at it, the first level is two strings and the plant is in between. Uh, the last pruning we did was about two weeks ago, and now we have a bunch of little suckers. And pruning on an indeterminate tomato plant is really easy. You just see these suckers in the in between the leaf, and all you need to do is just break them off. You can do that with your finger when they're small, and it goes pretty fast. You can also see too where blossoms are starting. And usually the first guys, you know, the first level or so, uh, they're not gonna set fruit. But uh, as we go up, they will. So when we uh, do this section, which is about 16 feet long, we're gonna go through, we're gonna tie it up probably about up to here to keep it on an overall basis. We wanna make certain that we hit at least every single plant that we get the growth stem through it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put the first string on and the way it works is, is you're going to weave it in between the plants, just like, kind of like a sine wave in between. Gonna loop around the outside, the inside, outside, inside, outside, inside. And then you'll come back with a second string at the same level and do the exact same thing, but in reverse. So in the end, your plant is tied up. Okay, the first thing we did before we start to weave this thing through is we pulled out some baling twine that's about probably 18, 18 or so feet because this is a 16 foot run and we just want to make sure we have more than enough to do the weave in back and forth and kind of loop it around the support posts and still be able to tie it off. So it's kind of a guesstimate, you know, but the bottom line is, is you want to pull your string out that is, uh, or have a string that's longer than your run. Okay, what I did here is I just looped the uh, string in my um, uh, right hand. And what I'm going to do is loop them around inside and out. So I'm gonna start with the outside of the first one, go to the inside of the second one, and then back and forth just like that. 
try to get them underneath the leaves so you're not rubbing up against where the, the fruiting body is. And then come around this side. And I'm gonna wanna pull it fairly tight around here. Extra string. around everything so now it's tight around this section these T posts uh, for these guys are about six foot apart okay then I'm gonna come back now you notice that it's on the inside here and so what I'm gonna do is come to the outside of this one and then the inside smells tomato -y. and we're getting a little bit of a sprinkle today too the nice thing about having these t-posts so close to each other is it gives a lot of good rigid support I'm gonna be a little different on this one here we're gonna go to the outside This guy goes to the inside. Don't be worried too much that if if some of these guys might have bent a little bit, they'll straighten themselves out once they're trellised up. So you're anchoring it on that last post? Uh-huh. Okay, now we've got our first string on. And things, you know, look a little cattywampus right now. But Is... they'll straighten themselves out when we put the second string on. Could you explain why you have white um, fencing stakes in? Yeah. Okay, before I put the second um, string on, uh, one of the questions you folks might have is you notice all these like fence rods, these white fence rods, what's this all about? Well, we have deer pressure here and um, they love to munch the tips right out of a tomato plant. And so what we've done is we've used the seven foot bird netting, which is attached at the top. And we put a seven foot section on each side of the T-post itself. The fence rods are just a way to kind of hold it back from continually uh, the wind blowing it into the plant itself. So actually what we've done is we've created kind of an A-frame tent of netting. So the plant inside the netting can grow and won't grow into the net, but will continue to grow up as it's, ter as it's um, you know, tied up. And uh, eventually these guys are gonna get to the size where the deer probably won't bother them that much. Uh, when they get near the top, we'll probably be taking the net off, and that'll be sometime in August or something of that nature. Uh, what we found is, is once the tomato plant uh, gets past the point where they have nice growth tips that they're interested in, they kind of like go on to more interesting things. Um, tomatoes, when, we notice this with peppers and things of that nature that they just love to grow right after the growth tips you know right because that's the juicy part where all the nutrients are um, but it's also unfortunately the part that you want to grow so as long as we protect that and get it above um, where deer are kind of lazy browsers they'll leave them alone so it looks kind of weird for right now but could you tell me what you have planted in front no yes i can um, what we did is we interplanted with um, a couple of different things. Uh, nasturtiums, kind of for color, and maybe put them a little bit in a salad. And then uh, some different types of lettuce um, that these guys will probably all be cropping out 
um, it's already ready, uh, lettuce is already ready to harvest. Uh, some of the lower leaves are, are looking pretty good. And these are all loose leaf lettuce types. So what we'll be able to do is just continue to pick leaves off uh, uh, the plant as it grows up a little bit and continue and get continuous harvest for probably like four or five weeks. Eventually the nasturtiums will kind of, these are kind of a more of a, they're not a trailing type, they're more of a bush type. So these guys will eventually, when the lettuce is finished, kind of fill in with each other. So it'll be around the base of the plant. Um, we didn't put anything in the back, but you know, uh, in a better world, we probably would have done that. Uh, put something similar in the back side of it um, to kind of give some shade to the ground itself. Uh, because it was so wet, we weren't able to get our compost in, so we don't have a uh, compost layer on top of the soil. So we're just going to use the plants to kind of give uh, as much protection as we can. The lettuce and the nasturtiums both are companions to tomatoes. Yeah. So, you know, they're friends, so you want to plant them together. Yeah, you you know, when we intercrop, we try to put stuff that is not antagonistic or has an aliopathic effect on one plant or the other. Or helps in prevent, um, per, for prevention of bugs and other... Well, those are always the theories, but you know, it's probably the truth of it is, is if you plant plants next to each other that one tries to dominate the other one, one's going to be healthy and the other will struggle. And a struggling plant usually is the one that gets hit by bugs. bugs. So um, everybody staying healthy makes it all healthy. So that'll work out pretty good. So let's put our second string on and then we can kind of get it all uh, ship shape. And I can see that, you know, those We've got this variety early Moscovich back there that is really beefy and uh, likes to kind of grow kind of crooked. So that one's going to be a challenge, I think, in, in terms of uh, keeping the trellis working right. These cherry tomatoes and slicers here, Nepal is the slicer. They're looking, they're looking pretty good, um, staying, you know, a little more straight. They're not tending to vine as much as the Moscoviches, so that's a, just an interesting observation. Okay, we're going to attach the second string now. This is going to be the mirror reverse image of our first one in. So our first tomato plant, the string was behind it, and the second one's going to go in front of it. Okay, and then it's just going to be the exact as we go down uh, the row, it'll be exactly kind of keeping it inside the weave itself. So that's the whole idea. And we want to have good tension on this. It's not, you don't want it slack. You want to make certain that you keep it as tight as possible. And when you get to a post, you definitely want to uh, you make sure that you got good tension on it. Okay, this is about it. I and mean, the only thing left to do now is uh, go down and do some pruning. And like I said, we take out these center little guys. And, and then also too, what I do is, as these bottom leaves start getting shaded out or they're not as vigorous as, as they were, and we getting more top growth going this way, I'm gonna begin pruning these bottom leaves off too. Uh, because they're not really going to be adding a lot photosynthetically to the plant. Uh, most of the extra work is going to be higher and higher up as the plant goes. And so probably at some point, um, the leaves will be pruned off the bottom of the plant, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about this high. Um, 
So, and you'll know when it's time to start pruning them off. At this point, it's still a little early. Uh, they're still green, they're still working for the plant, and uh, so we're not gonna do too much. But if you see any suckers, like here's at the bottom of this one, I've got a sucker coming out. I wanna make sure to take these off. So another reason for taking those lower leaves off is uh, the more vegetation you have on things, the more uh, things can hide. And the next thing you know, you've got a lateral branch that's a, you know, a size of a, of a, you know, and good, huge branch that could materially damage the plant if you take it off at that point. You always, when you're pruning these tomatoes, you want to get them at the point where uh, it's just an easy, you know, little uh, rub off with the finger. It's so, and the other thing about having them up on this trellis is if you come out on a daily basis and just take a look in your garden, it's really easy to see where you've got things you need to work on. So they're not hidden and it's not, it's not laying on the ground. As the tomatoes set, um, they're going to be elevated off the ground. And so this really works really well. Do you need to do that removal of lower leaves for good airflow? That is another, that's another benefit of doing that is, yeah, getting good airflow around the plant. Um, the less moisture that stays on a plant, uh, tomato plants in particular, kind of protects them from late season diseases. So anyway, our next step is we're just going to go through and just kind of make sure we get all the suckers off, uh, do a little weeding in here, and then we'll put the net back down. Have you done any kind of um, fertilizing or um, adding any kind of minerals and that kind of thing to the tomato plants? Yeah, um, we're using KNF treatments, Korean natural farming treatments, and what we've been doing um, when the weather, as the weather permits, about every seven to ten days, I am applying um, the base uh, maintenance solution which is brown rice vinegar, um, some FPJ from our comfrey plants, and also we're putting in um, OHN, or Oriental Herbal Nutrient. I'm kind of having a brain fog there for a moment. Um, those, those three things, <clears throat> plus uh, I alternate one week, I use fish aminos, and then the next week I'll use um, CalFOS. Uh, as an additional one. The calcium and phosphorus are helping the plant in terms of its root growth and structure and um, the nitrogen from the fish aminos uh, plus the other proteins are helping feed uh, the plant itself and then the base solution uh, just really helps for antipathogenic and molds and mildews and things like that. So considering how wet it's been um, these guys all look really pretty good. Do you attribute that to the KNF? I, I attribute to what it's overall doing is, is what you have to remember what it's doing is it's enhancing the plant's health. So a healthy plant that is getting everything it needs can fight off diseases and bugs much, much better. It's the same thing as like a healthy person doesn't usually get as sick or as sick as often as someone who isn't healthy. So it's all the same thing. Yeah, these were kind of yellow when we first put them in and they look really nice and green yeah if you go back and look at the uh first video when we were planting we had a late plant with these guys so there's a link so we're having weather that's very unusual yeah cool cooler and wetter than it's been for a number of years yeah so lettuce looks really good <laughs> yeah lettuce but... looks good sweet potatoes are struggling eggplants um, struggling plants are struggling squash is okay um snow but, peas have been great yeah <laughs> snow um, peas and lots of lettuce lots of lettuce and, and cold spinach crops. cold crops have been good too so you know there's if you're diversified there's always an advantage to something Okay, now that we've got the string in on both sides, one of the last things you can do, uh, besides making sure there's no leaves caught in between them, is now that there's a weave around holding the plant itself, as you can see, this is pretty tight around it, you can actually move the plant and keep it, you know, an erect, uh, not like sliding off one way or the other. So you can keep these guys kind of a little bit organized.
So that way, you know, you're not going to have them all sliding into each other um, because they're going to cross over. They can only go so far before they're going to hit that cross in the string. So I want to thank you guys for watching today. And, you know, if you have any thoughts on uh, your, your system for supports, I know I've been reluctant, and reluctant isn't the right word. I've been busy and I haven't really gotten back to um, the comments I need to answer of you folks. Maybe what we'll do is do a video and just, yeah, that'd be a good idea. We could just take a whole bunch of the comments and just answer them. Wow, that'd be great. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that way we can get them out there. Um, do appreciate you guys watching, and uh, I hope you 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 can have a good, successful tomato crop yourself this year. And uh, thanks again, and you have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.